Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing very well. Time for part two of the rarest and strangest aircraft that were ever made. Some are still in existence in museums, some are gone forever. We've got halfway down the list and this is the next one which is pretty crazy. It's like one side is a fuselage engine and, one's, and, the, and the human fuselage, if you like, is on the other side. Uh, it must be like perfectly counterbalanced. Is it got one? Pro it's just one propeller. It must be a reconnaissance plane because that could not do any kind of combat. Clearly, for one, the Blomberg Boss BV141 was a World War II German tactical reconnaissance aircraft. Thought so. It is notable for its uncommon structural asymmetry. Although the Blomberg Boss 141 performed well, it was never ordered into full-scale production for reasons that included the unavailability of the preferred engine because it's only got one engine and the competition from another tactical reconnaissance aircraft. Real interesting piece of kit still, I think. Now, we're next on to this now thing. Uh, it says no idea, and it's like a, a circular wing, as in sectional circular, if you guys can see that. I don't get it. <laughs> I mean, there's... Okay, so you've got one airfoil down on the bottom, and then you must have, well, the same airfoil, but kind of inversed, if you like, at the top. Uh, can anyone think why this is a thing? Because I can't think why this is a thing. Honestly, this just looks like a backyard kind of a project. <laughs> mm -hmm. Matt was actually flying this thing. Wow. Oh. Really? How interesting. Oh, there's actually a video of it. I'm out. How does it work? How does it work? Magna code. Magna code. Well, I guess if there is enough lifting body, it technically will work. Because yeah. if, if you look at it, uh, it kind of just looks like a biplane, but with just the wings connected. Mm -hmm. Yep, I guess you're right. So the lateral points of the wing are essentially just normal wing. Yeah. It's just because the wings are pinched. It has to be Russian, doesn't it? <laughs> right. So I don't really know why someone built it, but they did. They must have ailerons. Do you reckon they were using the rudder to roll, or they've actually got ailerons? I don't know. Anyway, there you go. Next, the XF-80 Thor Thunder Screech Fighter. And this is interesting. This looks like Jet Plus, Jet Push and Prop pull hybrid it was a project to develop a high-speed turbo shaft fighter that offered better range via lower fuel consumption at subsonic jet speeds the downside the propeller tips exceeded the speed of sound making it much noisier than pure jets it was reported that the sound of the supersonic prop could be heard 25 miles away has anyone ever heard a supersonic prop before by the way quite unlikely i suppose not really yeah there is one which is on the bear because the blades mm. are moving faster than the sound um so i'm assuming this is shafted to the turbojet engine at the back i'm assuming it's not a separate engine that would make sense to me but maybe I'm, maybe i'm wrong i don't know okay fine okay ivan ivan's gone finally gone crazy it was dropping eggs not bombs on the enemy there <laughs> there's an egg there's a chicken chicken aeroplane Mmm, <laughs> chicken aeroplane. Uh, we've got a fairy barracuda. Look at the picture down below. It's all the rear picture. What's all those surfaces? Uh, oh, is it because the wings are folded back? Is that what it is? Yeah, it must just be the wings are folded back. Fairy barracuda with folded wings, aka Megatron's granddad. The fairy barracuda was a British carrier borne torpedo and dive bomber designed by Fairy Aviation. It was the first aircraft of this type operated by the Royal Navy's fleet air arm FAA to be fabricated entirely from metal. I was not aware of that. Okay, very good. Next. Oh, and this looks like the kind of thing that RC would fly if he could, I think. Um, What's that? The barrel thing below. We've seen the barrel, RC. <laughs> this is RC's plane. Yeah, look at that engine. It's not that <laughs> yes. ergonomic, is it? The Leduc 021 was a research aircraft built. It has to be French, doesn't it? France in 1953 to refine the practicalities of ramjet propulsion. Initially proposed as the 0 0.20, it was essentially similar to its predecessor, the Leduc 0.10. Interesting naming system. Sexy. But scaled up to by around 30% with tip tanks added to the wings. Again, it was not capable of takeoff under its own power. 
and had to be carried aloft and released. A bit more about the 021 Ivan. Was, did it ever fly? And do you know? Yeah, quite a few times. They were just trying to do the ramjet thing. And what were their, do we know what their findings, their conclusions were of the ramjet operation? Not sufficient to produce, I guess. Just not working at that point. And then we've got a thing, guys. This looks like something that someone's just photoshopped and added all of the pylons on the F-16 or F-15. But, okay. Well, I had no idea this was this existed. Do we have a Caspian sea monster, Has. It's a real thing, and it basically managed to panic the whole of the Western world because wow. they didn't know they had a satellite uh, image on it, but they didn't know how that thing can fly. Yeah, right. It's amazing. It looks amazing. like those have got to be sandbox missile launches on the top, something like that. Um, That's an arrow <laughs> foil, right? Yeah, it rides on the cushion of air above the sea. Oh, is it? Like oh, uh, I'm just looking at the thing that amazed me is the size of the uh, the tailplanes at the back, the uh, horizontal, you know, horizontal stabs at the back there. They're like, as big as the wings. Let's read about it. Known colloquially as the Caspian Sea Monster was an experimental ground, oh, you're right, effect vehicle, air cranoplane, air cranoplane, developed in the Soviet Union, it has to be the Soviet Union, in the 1960s by the Central Hydrophile Design Bureau. The KM began operation in 1966 and was continuously tested by the Soviet Navy until 1980. The KM was the largest and heaviest aircraft in the world from 1966 to 1988. Wow, let's try that. The largest and the heaviest aircraft. Not surprised, look at the size of it. And its surprise discovery by the United States and subsequent attempts to determine its purpose became a distinctive event of espionage during the Cold War. Roughly the length of the 747, the London class carrier six, uh, so it carries uh, six times sunburns on the anti-ship missiles on the top there. So it's a ship killer. Ship missiles as well as four 23mm GSHs. Not sure what that would be for, but okay. General characteristics, length, 300 feet. Wingspan, 123 feet. Tail stabilizer span, which is what I noticed. Yeah, basically the same as the wings. Don't understand that, but that's amazing. Height, 71 feet. Wing area, seven, over 7,000 square feet. Uh, empty weight, wow, half a million pounds. So it doesn't. it never actually takes off per se, does it? It's ground effect only. Max takeoff weight, 1.2 million pounds. Power plants, 10 times... Dobrinin VD-7 turbojet, each, wow, massive, each at 29,000 pounds of thrust, the same as a F-16. Holy banana cakes, that's a lot of power. 280,000 total thrust, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> Performance, maximum speed, 300, uh, where we got here, 270 knots. Uh, cruise speed, 230 knots. Range, so it is tactically pretty sh crap with its speed. Range 1,500 kilometers, 900 miles, 800 nautical miles, not particularly good. Ground effect altitude, uh, so it's between 13 and 45 feet. Maximum sea state, 3 feet. I don't know what that means. Was there only one ever built? Quite a few actually, different oh. configurations. Wow. The interesting part of it is uh, basically the US satellites, they've managed to take a photo of it, but uh, without the wings, basically, mm -hmm. because it does not have wings. Mm -hmm. So they thought it was still under construction and they'll attach a massive wings on that and fly it. Mm -hmm. So is it f does it fly with power of these wings or is it... No, basically they didn't know that it's just hovering on top of the surface mm -hmm. of the water. Interesting, so that they would, it would have been high level or something. It's, it's very interesting. God, imagine the drag. And if you look at the front, the picture below, it's got like a like front, it's like a ship where you can go out and do fishing and stuff. It really is quite amazing. The bulges on the vertical stabilizer, radar, question mark? I presume so. Uh, wow, I'd love to be able to see something like that in real life. How interesting must that construction be? Okay, very good. We've got the Caproni uh, CA60. What the bloody hell? It's cool, right? Flying boats are so freaking cool. They're galleys between the wing sets, so you can walk between the wing sets. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, 6 times 3, 18 wings. How many <laughs> wings can we fit on this thing? The CA60 was a flying boat and served as a prototype for a 100 passenger transatlantic plane. It had 8 engines, 9 wings, and flew once to an altitude of 60 feet. It promptly crashed into the water. Fortunately, the pilot survived. Well, not that surprised, really, are we? Amazingly cool. Someone designed that. It doesn't say when it was. I'd love to know when that was. 
I'm very optimistic though. Yeah, yeah. It just mm, <laughs> doesn't look very flyy. Okay, very good. Okay. Run on the end. Oh, I remember this one. This one's cool. The Lockheed XFV. So it can take off vertically and then transition to level flight. Lockheed's attempt at combining a helicopter and an airplane yielded interesting results. The XFV did manage to transition from conventional to a vertical flight, but its lack of speed and need for high experienced pilots placed it on the chopping block. Very interesting. I remember videos of that going. We've got the Hiller X-18, aka Megatron's mother. This is an interesting piece of kit. So this is all stuff before, before the Osprey. It is an Osprey prototype, actually sort of. The X-18 was the first testbed for tilting and V-style technology. Unfortunately, the X-18 didn't handle wind gusts well, not surprised, and the engines um, weren't cross-linked, meaning an engine failure would result in a crash. So the problem here is that you rotate the entire wing, whereas the Osprey just rotates the engines. So you basically put a massive sail up, don't you? And it's just going to capture the wind and uh, be problematic at best. Oh my god, here's a thing. Question mark. It looks kind of amazing. Slash Star Wars. Slash. It's just cool. Just very cool. Has to be Russian. Has to be Russian. Has to be Russian. The Bartini Biriev VVA14. It looks like something out of Star Wars, but it was designed and flown here on Earth. The VVA14 was a Russian surprise ground effect aircraft designed to hunt US Navy submarines. The 14 uh, Vertical Amphibia. Vertical takeoff amphibious aircraft was a wing in ground effect aircraft developed in the Soviet Union during the 1970s, designed to be able to take off from the water and fly at high speed over long distances. It was to make true flights at high altitude but also have the capability of flying efficiently just above the sea surface using aerodynamic ground effect. Was there only one made of these, uh, Ivan, that we know of? Oh, a few again, and they had a commercial version as well, which was flying with Aeroflot. Wow, so this is a real thing. How interesting. Well, you can see it underneath with the wings, actually. So the body is kind of like a, almost like a hydrofoil type thing, which is interesting. And then the wings, the flight, very interesting. Uh, next, we've got the De Lackner HZ-1 Aerocycle which looks incredibly dangerous because that is a turning blade there, isn't it? Uh, this one-man personal helicopter was designed as a reconnaissance aircraft for the army. Unfortunately, it was hard to fly, yeah. And the thought of standing on top of an unguarded lawnmower blade wasn't very appealing to anyone. How would you feel about testing that out, RC? <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. I'll take care of it. No, right, good, thank you. Yeah. That's your job at the end of the day, RC. Do it. Mm. Well, at least you won't get into mm. a flat spin with it. No, no. <laughs> right, we've got another RC plane here for you. The Snickma. Didn't they make the uh, engine for the Mirage? Uh, oh, God. Cool. Coleo Upper. Oh, I can't say it. Looks like a big fan with a cockpit stuck on top. The circular duct around the engine was an annular wing. Somehow, the wing was able to produce lift in horizontal flight, but I'm not sure of the aerodynamics. During testing, it managed to take off and land vertically, but, as you can imagine, tended to roll around on its vertical axis. It briefly achieved horizontal flight accidentally on its ninth and last flight. That was right about the time the pilot ejected. Wow. Well, what was it? Was it a rotor blade inside there? I'm a bit confused. Well, I couldn't find. It's either that or some kind of a jet. I wonder if it's a bit like the, you know, the, 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 the winged, the circular winged Russian plane that we saw a little bit before. Some theory based on that. How interesting. Next, a kind of pseudo steampunk F-16 here. The Nord 1500 Griffin was an experimental ramjet powered fighter aircraft designed and built in the mid 50s by French state owned aircraft manufacturer Nord Air Aviation. The somewhat more conventional looking Nord Griffin actually did go to Mach 2 Plus using a combination of turbojet and ramjet power plant. So this, if it was ramjet only, then it's going to have to be towed up to a certain speed, right? Yeah, so you have the normal jet and then the ramjet kicks in at a certain speed. But in any interesting findings of it? Did it actually work? Yeah, it was quite good actually. It oh. succeeded all the expectations, but because it was quite expensive, they preferred to go the standard ways. Oh, jump. Um, so it's tiny little delta wings, look. 
and, and four planes. 1950s, Mach 2. Mm. Yeah, I think there were two built and they're still existing, but they're not flyable. Yeah, roger. Very interesting. Okay, a Gloucester Meteor Prone. So I'm fully aware of the Meteor, but this is a Meteor with something stuck on the front. Not to be outdone, the British produced their share. One was a Gloucester Meteor Prone pilot concept. Having the pilot lay on his belly, it was thought would be better to allow him to withstand the G-forces of the manoeuvring flight. The idea actually worked, but it had a couple of flaws. The biggest one being that the pilot couldn't really check the six. So he, so this is like an early version of, extreme version of the reclined F-16 seats there, and that he's going to lay down basically to dogfight. Do you know what, what, how far re reclined he was? Well, he wasn't. He was lying on his belly. Oh, sorry. Oh god, that's even worse. Forward. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's kind of like I think it looks it's like the uh, the Batmobile, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You lie on the in front of you and then the, the pilot it, but yeah, it, then checking your six would be a very big problem. I mean, I mean, G was a real problem before we before the G suits were made. The coming out of I mean, even the late even the late war warbird, late World War Two warbirds were really struggling and under G's. And so, as soon as you've got jets and another couple of hundred miles an hour, G's a really big thing. You know, take your saber out or your MiG fifteen, you're constantly over G. So interesting, very good, very good. Oh, it's one of these annual wing. Looks beautiful. Steeper Caproni. The Steeper Caproni was generally called the Caproni Steeper, okay? Was an experimental Italian aircraft in 1932 by Luigi Steeper um, and built by Caproni. It featured a hollow barrel shaped fuselage with the engine and propeller completely enclosed by the fuselage. In essence, the whole fuselage was a single ducted fan. Oh, sorry, it does have wings. Hang on, what? I'm confused why it's where they've done this. Am I missing the obvious? I don't see why there's this big duct. Ducked. Obviously, to avoid bird strikes. <laughs> okay, well, they did it for a reason. Get the feeling it didn't catch well, the ducted on. The fan was a precursor to a jet engine mm. in terms of the airflow. I know you can improve efficiency of a fan with it ducted, but it doesn't, you know, you're going to lose any gains you get are going to be lost by the ridiculous weight and aerodynamics of this thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess if you have a nozzle on the back, then you can concentrate the jet stream mm -hmm. and push you forward a bit more. Oh, now this is interesting. Look at that. What a beast. So many cool flying boats were made. I just don't know anything about them. Got to be Russian. Got to be Russian. Got to be Russian. The A-90 Eaglet uh, is a Soviet Ekranoplan, a ground effect vehicle that was designed by <laughs> that person. The A-90 uses ground effect to fly a few meters above the surface. Again, the Russians classify it as an Ekranoplan Class B. It can achieve an altitude of 10,000 feet. Well, that's impressive. So it's a Ekranoplan, but it can also fly, probably, if you like. Amazing that it's it's a big body plane, but only has one engine with contra propellers. I'm amazed that one little engine there could actually make that plane go. Was this ever in service? I guess it was. Yeah, it was. It was a passenger jet, basically, where you don't have runways, you have water. Thing is, the, the, you don't have that much water, many water bodies in Russia. Oh, I guess it's Soviet, isn't it? So, I guess it was yeah. Russia. Right, fair play. You and your crazy Soviet planes, Ivan. Oh, God, it just gets worse. Nemeth Parasol. Uh, Nemeth Parasol was a prototype of a tail dragger airplane with a circular wing set in a parasol configuration. So, yeah, and obviously they didn't catch on very well, but interesting. It was flying. It was flying. This seems to be the uh, same with the that pancake plane. Yep. Uh, yep. Before the in, in, interesting. In, that, in, that, in, was, in, that was a lot later. I mean, this looks uh, 20 years before that, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And I can see aileron type things on the disc. So I'm guessing that's how it rolled. Not sure I trust it, but okay. Interesting. You may, <laughs> you've actually got quite a large wing surface there. If you, you know, okay. It looks like they just take, they took the uh, the radar uh -huh. dish from the e e tree mm -hmm. and just put it on top of it. Pretty much what you're doing, yeah. <laughs> Make Maybe it was an early attempt of AWACS or something. <laughs> Follow-up question. Does the E3 AWACS dish generate lift? Who knows? Whoa! Mm. This is a, wow, this is a midget. I love this already. I want one RC, so me and you can get to our meetings quicker. Okay, so here we have... Our meeting? Oh, <laughs> Look well, at we, that thing. Yes. Yeah, very good, I like that. 
Next, we've got possibly Mil MIB7 experimental aircraft with jet engines mounted on the rotor the rotor blade tips. Okay, sounds like you're creating a bigger problem than you're solving. Question mark. Okay, but <laughs> I don't know. They were saying that it was quite successful, but for some reason, I guess the engines were quite I don't know dangerous to run like this. The only yeah, I mean, my thoughts would be that. Yes, you can reduce need for gearbox and linkages and all that nasty stuff, but uh, you're having to operate a jet engine that's operating with a massive centrifugal force on it. Can you imagine having to duct that fuel and stuff around with all, all those nasty forces? Must be a problem. And how and how does the prop of the jet engine inside, how does that balance with such a large force on it? Hmm. Okay. Interesting. And if and if they're spinning around like that, wouldn't mean that the the jet the engine is like sucking in the exhaust of the. <laughs> that's actually yes. Pre, pre sucking <laughs> pre combusted air. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, Ivan says it was good. Here's a thing. It's got the ugliest plane in the world. It's a flying wing with giant booties on it. What was that all about? It is yes, a flying with giant booties on it. How interesting. And there's a model of it. Wow. Massive twin boom. Six engine. Oh, look, there's, there's a man with a machine gun in each of the booties. It was supposed to be a flying fortress. Uh, technically, it is. I mean, I'm just spotting as we go all the machine guns. So one on each pod at the bottom, one on the nose, um, two uh, each, or well, one each on the, the mid uh, boom. And two tail gunners. How interesting. I guess we know where the the uh, the B-17 got its inspiration uh -huh. from. Mm -hmm. It is a Kalinin K-7. And these things fly really slow as well, so it would have been really cool, actually. The K-7 was a heavy experimental aircraft designed and tested in the Soviet Union in the early 1930s. It was of unusual configuration with twin booms and large underwing pods housed fixed landing gear and machine gun turrets. In the passenger version, seats were arranged inside the 2.3 meter thick wing. Okay, the airframe was welded from KHMA chrome molybdenum steel. Chrome molybdenum. The original design called for six engines in the wing leading edge, but when the projected load loaded weight was exceeded, two more engines were added. Similar characteristics: crew 12, two pilots. Uh, navig navigator, bombardier, radio operator, gunner, uh, apparently there's a nose cannon, yep, we've seen that. Uh, flight engineer, four times gunners, uh, two times gunners, all with 20 mil cannons by the looks of it. Mm, capacity, 120 passengers, actually pretty good. 700 kilos of cargo, especially pretty good for the time. 90 feet, 170 feet, 40 feet. Big old wing area. Airfoil was thus. Empty weight was 53,000. Gross weight 83,000. Maximum with bombs 93,000. Maximum take off weight 102,000 pounds. Fuel mm, plenty. Power plant seven times those V12s, each at 750 horsepower. Um, props max performance 140 miles an hour and 110 miles an hour cruise. Very interesting. There is one other plane that I thought was interesting. Sent. And I thought it would be interesting for you because it has is bristling with huge guns. Shinden Magnificent Lightning Fighter was a World War II Japanese propeller-driven aircraft prototype with wings at the rear of the fuselage. Oh, that must have been unstable, right? Uh, a nose-mounted canard and pusher engine. Developed by the Imperial Japanese Navy as a short-range land-based interceptor, the J-7W was a response to the Boeing B-29 Super Vultures raids on the Japanese home islands. For interception missions, the J-7W was to be armed with four, wow, four forward-firing 30 mil cannons in the nose. How do you fit them in there? That's a big old there's no, bunker. Yeah, because there's no engine in the front, so they can pull ah, whatever they want. Ah, so that's <laughs> why they did it. So they just filled the nose full of giant, thumping, great cannons there. Yeah. Highly medieval interceptor, but only two prior interceptors finished by the end of the war. A jet engine power version was considered, but never reached the drawing board. How interesting. What, what a piece of kit. Let me try Oh, wow, look at that. I'm not sure I'd want to fly that. Actually, I would. It looks really advanced for World War Two. It looks 
cool. I mean, it does look very cool. It does look very cool. Is that the kind of thing you load up X plane and just make your own plane, and that's the first thing you would make? <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right. Okay. That's the end of that. Uh, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, and we'll see you guys later.